I have been stretched across the poles of language. On one end is its generative pole. This means that language has the capacity of not only creating thought in your brain, but also in instilling it in others. I rely on this as a writer. Let me try it out on you all. So, if I narrate to you a childhood anecdote, when I gave my brother Barkat my precious pocket money to go and get me some sweets from the corner shop that we would share, but he ate all of them by himself on the way back, you can all imagine my bewilderment. If I talk about the long line of refugees, of which I was one, during the Gulf War, at the Iraq-Turkey border, sleeping on roads, going to toilet in the fields, while the political heads decided what our fate was going to be like. You can all participate in my duress. If I describe what I felt when I held my baby in my arms for the first time, having struggled with infertility for nine years, you can all feel my joy. It's the generative power of language that lends itself into poetry and literature. It creates new realities and paradigms and cognitive remodeling. It just made you all witness to three obscure events of my life, which for the record are all true. Language is the one main thing that differentiates human beings from other creations. It is essentially what makes us human. The last rung on the evolutionary ladder, as they say. This explains why the human brain is so much bigger than all the other species. Because it has so much to do with language. Would you like to see how? So what you listen goes into your brain to a place called the auditory cortex. What you read goes to a visual cortex. Information from these two areas is sent to a place called Wernicke's area. Here meaning and comprehension is initiated. This information is transferred via arcuate fasciculus to a place called Broca's area where speech is generated. This parcel is sent to the parts of the brain that control the movements of your lips, tongue, throat, mouth, and that's how sounds are produced. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. Luckily, you don't have to remember all this. Your brain does this automatically within milliseconds, which is why we can have fluent, unending conversations. And if you're a Lahori, which you all are, you can imagine how fast your brain has to work to keep up with the speed of your speech. But what if you lose this domain? Just consider this. We've all had the occasional incident whereby we cannot come up with a word, or a song gets stuck in our heads, or we listen to a foreign language like Chinese and don't understand what it means. But what if this inability to understand or to say something lasts longer than an instant, becomes permanent? Losing language is not the same as never acquiring it. When you lose language after having acquired it normally, it is always due to an insult or injury to your brain. The technical term for this is aphasia. This is the other pole of language. And I deal with this as a neuro-rehab physician. 
any interruption in the path of language that we just saw can cause aphasia, which is why you can have different intensities and different types of aphasia, depending on how much damage that has been done. However, aphasia does not affect hearing or intelligence. I must mention here the distinction between speech and language. We often confuse the two. Speech is the oral, the vocal manifestation of language, but language is much more than that. Reading, writing, to some extent thinking are part of language. Sign language is part of the language spectrum in the deaf population. So aphasia can affect any of these modalities in various forms. You can imagine that losing the ability to rely on language is like being imprisoned in your own mind. And yet, it's not a rare phenomenon at all. Almost 30 to 40 percent of stroke survivors alone are left with a certain degree of aphasia. However, most people have not heard about it. With a show of hands, can I please ask how many of you know a person with aphasia or have heard about this before? A few, that's good, but as expected, not many. Since I've told you that I've been stretched across the poles of language, from expressive to reticent, from articulate to limited, from eloquence to aphasia, let me tell you how. A decade ago, when I was completing my training in neurology in England, my brother Barkat, the same one who stole my sweets, had a hit and run road traffic accident here in Lahore. He was in his final year of chartered accountancy. He sustained severe brain injuries. He was in a coma for three months. This event was like 9-11 for our family. Life was divided into a before and after. Waking up from a coma isn't the happy ending that is portrayed in movies. It's the start of a lifetime of commitment, resolve, and a constant struggle between hope and despair. Barkat was paralyzed all down his right side. His arm, leg, right side of his face, throat, tongue, lips. And on top of this, my eloquent and articulate brother, who wrote and sang songs, had aphasia. Our initial and immediate concerns, obviously, were to try and get some semblance of normalcy for him. It took him almost a year to get a certain degree of independence, one excruciating step at a time. First, the tracheostomy was removed, then the diapers came off, then the wheelchair became redundant, then he started walking on his own. Not everything came back, though. His right hand remained weak, and after multiple failures, a ray of hope shone when he picked up the pencil in his left hand and tried to scribble with it. Barkat held on to that hope. And it was as if he's a three-year-old once again, learning how to hold a pencil. He persisted, and he taught himself how to draw and paint. His journey from not even being able to open paint bottles to creating internationally acclaimed masterpieces is truly remarkable. Of course, he couldn't keep up with all his dreams. He couldn't complete his CA. Instead, he did a BFA honors 
in fine arts and is now enrolled in the master's program in the most prestigious art, art institution of the country. A round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. But he still struggles with aphasia. In trying to help Barkat navigate through a life and existence without language, my journey into the expanse of language commenced. Doing this from a point of personal interest was so different from all the knowledge and training I had as a doctor. To understand that if he wrote awful to a picture of mine, he may really mean awesome. This required a certain level of understanding that I did not have before. Living with aphasia is different from dealing with it in clinic. We learned how to be patient, to use gestures, point and tell techniques, say our things slowly, repeat often, use alternate phrases. And this was just us, the onlookers. I will show you a conversation, a recent conversation I've had with Barkat. A decade after his accident, he prefers to talk to me on WhatsApp, his favorite medium, and he writes in English. Have a look. So you see, you can immediately pick up that you can't, you have to look at language beyond the grammatical structure and even the individual words. You begin to understand that language does not always communicate. This is why aphasia is the most isolating disability amongst all disabilities. And I don't make that claim. It has been proven scientifically. I've seen life now from the eyes of a special needs family. And I understand that the hurdles and setbacks that we face are not because of malice. They're purely because of ignorance. And each one of these is an opportunity to create awareness. In trying to help Barkat to compensate for his aphasia, I had to supersize my linguistic capacity. I became a writer and an activist. It started with a Facebook page and a blog called My Amazing Brother Barkat. But since then, it has grown considerably. In a long string of projects that we have undertaken to promote inclusivity and to educate against disability, the last and most significant one is the development of the Aphasia Research Network of Pakistan, an organization dedicated to working with aphasia in Pakistan. I work with language, on language. I use language both as a tool and as a substrate, both clinical and literary. Why, you ask? Well, why not? I have Barkat as an example of what can be achieved despite everything that is lost. It's a matter of responsibility. In the words of Richard Pimentel, responsibility is made up of two words, response and ability. Responsibility isn't something that someone puts on you. We find ourselves in situations, and we find ourselves asking what it is that we can do. What makes a difference is what response you give with the ability that you have. Barkat has shown me that a sure, short way of fulfilling your responsibility is to become the best version of yourself including the things that you can and cannot do. That way your light radiates across all limitations and boundaries. 
Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you my travel guide and companion across this language scape, my amazing brother Barkath.